Chapter 3, Commandment 1, Know Thy Material. Whether you're talking about widget fasteners, batting averages, or Book 10 of Plato's Republic, whether you're delivering a speech to an auditorium, a boardroom, or a Cub Scout pack, knowing what you're talking about is the key to effective public speaking. When you know what you're talking about, everything, and I mean everything, improves. And when you don't know what you're talking about, everything, and I mean everything, gets worse. As a professor, when I've taken the time to study, organize, and internalize my lesson plan, I've been able to illustrate points with impromptu examples, diagram interconnected concepts on the board, and answer tough questions with ease. Well, they're philosophical questions, so maybe not with ease, but with more ease than I had I shown up unprepared. However, on the rare occasion that I've tried to lecture without adequate prep, even when I thought I understood the material, I've struggled to articulate my points, stumbled through crude explanations, and worried the whole time a student would ask a question I couldn't answer. Not fun. That's why knowing your material not only impacts the content of your presentation, but the quality of your delivery. On the days I knew my stuff and knew I knew my stuff, the confidence that followed felt great. But on days I didn't know my stuff and knew I didn't know my stuff, the anxiety that followed made me feel terrible. Feeling crummy inside ruined my delivery, as well as my students' experience. One third of the class would look confused, one third would look frustrated, and the other third would just look out the window. Studying, organizing, and streamlining your material takes time. But the key that distinguishes great presenters from okay presenters is intelligent message development. You can be confident, well-spoken, and look fabulous. But if your message is confusing and your core idea is buried under distracting fluff, your audience won't learn much, even if they're superficially impressed. She sure was a smooth talker. What was she talking about again? The good news is that you can develop a clear and memorable presentation and come to thoroughly know your material via seven easy steps. 1. Clarify your goals and sketch an outline. 2. Embrace your role as expert and teacher. 3. Consider your audience. 4. Download and unpack your core message. 5. Logically arrange your ideas. 6. Backfill with analogies, examples, and stories. And 7. Revise using Zenzer's four principles. 1. Clarify your goals and sketch an outline. Once you've committed to give a talk, ask yourself, what's the purpose? What do I want my audience to understand, accept, remember, or do? What are my draft key points? What visual aids might I use? How can I actively involve the audience? Speaking coach and achievement guru Brian Tracy calls this initial brainstorming phase the down dump. Imagine what would need to happen for your talk to go perfectly, then capture everything that comes to mind. Messy is fine. Disorganized is fine. Just capture. Once it's out, then switch into organization mode. Tracy suggests drawing five circles on a sheet of paper and bucketing your ideas based on where they best fit. Opening, close, or under key points A, B, or C. Rather than circles, I'll often use PowerPoint. I'll title slides and type in placeholder details to revise later, such as Insert Map of Ethics Bowl Expansion Here, or F-22 Raptor Combat Takeoff Clip Here. I've also organized talks using tiered lists. For example, if I were planning a pregame speech for my old T-ball team, I'd first type out our goals for the season. Have fun, make friends, build confidence, learn t-ball basics. Then I'd think about what I could say and do during the 90 seconds between warming up and taking the field that would help bring those goals about. Have fun. Lead team cheer. Go Panthers! Make friends. Exchange high fives. Build confidence. Compliment each player on one area of improvement. And learn t-ball basics. Reinforce a tip from practice. For the final draft, we can remove the background goals, and no outline is complete without a proper ordering. The team cheer comes at the very end, and we should exchange high fives before the individual encouragement and the tip from practice. Plus, a little more detail would be nice, so I should add a few sub-bullets. How about 1. Exchange high fives 2. Compliment each player on one area of improvement. Andrew's patience 
Lexi's swing, Miles' defense, Amelia's speed, Justin's throwing, Malia's focus. 3. Reinforce a tip from practice. Do not hit me with the bat. And 4. Lead team cheer. Go Panthers! We'll talk more about ordering and fleshing out your ideas in a moment. The point here is to clarify your goals and sketch an outline consistent with them as soon as possible. As Stephen Covey puts it, when we, quote, begin with the end in mind, end quote, we have a much better chance of arriving somewhere we want and a much better time getting there. Two, embrace your role as expert and teacher. It doesn't matter if I'm discussing the giving tree with third graders, teaching awareness and avoidance to self-defense students, or briefing executives on business ethics. Presentations go better when I think of myself as an expert and teacher. Adopting the expert mindset sets the expectation that by the time you present, you'll know what you're talking about. And thinking of yourself as a teacher, whether you'll be presenting in an official classroom setting or not, reinforces the fact that it's on you to get those ideas into the heads of your audience members. The result is that you'll show up much better prepared, much more comfortable than you'd otherwise be, and your audience will learn much more than they otherwise would. Note the importance of being both expert and teacher. We've all known experts who report teachers and charismatic, passionate teachers who didn't know their stuff. Our aim is to embody the best of both, to have something to convey as well as the ability to convey it. If you happen to be presenting on a topic you know little about, the beauty of public speaking is that studying it and organizing your ideas will make you a quasi-expert in the process. The adage, if you want to master a subject, teach it, is true. Since you're now cool with being a teacher, here's a secret. You can teach almost anyone almost anything by following three simple steps. Relate, unpack, and reinforce. Whatever your topic, connect it to something your audience already understands. Explain how the two are similar and clarify the nuances. When my oldest son was three, he asked me to teach him about hockey. So I related it to a game he already understood and enjoyed. Soccer. Hockey, son, is soccer with sticks on ice. The soccer connection enabled him to envision goals on either end of an icy playing area, through which players would attempt to knock something with sticks. I explained that something was a puck, a smooth rock shaped like a big Oreo cookie, and that the players wore special shoes similar to his roller skates, except with metal blades on the bottom instead of wheels. In just a few seconds, he knew a whole lot about hockey due to connections to things he already understood. Soccer cookies, and roller skates. Similarly, at the beginning of this book, I helped you appreciate the importance of stage time for new speakers by relating it to the importance of pool time for new swimmers. You can teach almost anyone almost anything the same way by relating new knowledge to existing knowledge. However, people learn differently. Some learn best by hearing, some by seeing, others by focusing on the big picture, and others by examining the smaller parts. Education experts call these the verbal, visual, global, and analytic learning styles. As a professor, I've sometimes been asked by the university to give my students a survey at the beginning of a new semester to assess their learning styles. These are more for my students' benefit than mine. For I always have some who are dominant verbal, learn best via the spoken word, some who are dominant visual, need images, some who are dominant global, prefer big picture explanations, and some who are dominant analytic, crave the finer details. Since I'm responsible for teaching everyone, not simply those who prefer the most common learning style, it's best to engage every style, every class. Having to cover all four styles might sound a little intimidating, but most of us do it automatically. Just imagine any coach giving any halftime locker room speech. What do you see? Is he explaining his strategy for the second half with his gravelly voice, verbal? Or is he drawing X's and O's on a dusty chalkboard, visual? Is he talking about high-level strategy, global? Or is he also giving guidance to specific players, analytic? Chances are good that he's engaging all four learning styles without even trying chances are good that you will too. You won't always have a chalkboard at your disposal, but you will always have your voice and you can use it to paint images in the minds of your visual learners, 
just like I painted that locker room scene for you. So accept and remember that as a public speaker, you're an expert and a teacher. Study your subject, be able to relate it to something your audience already understands, and keep those learning styles in mind. But don't sweat them too much. You're likely to address all four without even trying. Three, consider your audience. People are people. So long as you clearly communicate a logically arranged message with good examples that connect new ideas to ideas they already understand, any human should be able to follow. However, the exact language you use, how deeply you delve into your subject, your areas of emphasis, and your examples do need customization. Say you're giving a 30-minute presentation on rocket boosters. If you'll be speaking to kindergartners, you might begin with a group countdown to get their attention. Three, two, one, blast off! Then pass around a model rocket for the kids to examine and inevitably break. You could explain that the body of a rocket is a cylinder, like Oscar from Sesame Street's unfortunate trash can house. And given their short attention spans, you might present for five minutes and spend the other 25 helping them build cardboard models of their own, which you could then accidentally break. If your audience is chemical engineering graduate students, your explanations can be more abstract and complex, and your learning goals more ambitious. Feel free to cite fancy equations. Engineering students love fancy equations. And if your audience is somewhere in between, perhaps bright lay people like us, just consider what you can expect them to know and adjust. It's also smart to consider what your audience desires to get out of your talk. For example, if I were a baseball team manager, given 30 minutes to brief the owner on equipment needs, I wouldn't bore her with a lecture on the history of sports equipment or opine on the incompetence of the bat boys. From the owner's perspective, these issues are irrelevant or someone else's problem. Instead, I'd present the main content around the key decision. The owner would likely be interested in cost effectiveness, which pieces of equipment, brands, and models are best, the reasons for considering them better than the competition, and how much better we can expect the players to perform with them. I would also be wise to build in a few extra minutes for discussion. People in leadership positions almost always request clarification, in rare cases because they enjoy seeing subordinates squirm, but usually because they value your perspective. So I could save the last 10 minutes for Q&A, answer everything I could, and promise to get back with her on anything I couldn't. It would also be a good idea to end on schedule, for while speakers should always be respectful of their audience's time, it's smart to be extra mindful of the clock the further you go up any chain of command. So think about your audience during message development and tailor your talk to their likely interests, background, and expectations. Kindergartners like Sesame Street, grad students like equations, and leaders like meetings to end on time. Four, download and unpack your core message. At this point, you've clarified your goals, embraced your role as expert and teacher, considered your audience, and you're ready to add some serious meat to the skeleton you sketched in step one. While you may be tempted to take what you have to the stage, every quality presentation I've ever given required reflection, reorganization, and revision. I've thrown together shoddy presentations that got the job done, but every one would have been better if I'd taken the time to unpack, revise, and reorganize. This is because understanding improves when we download our ideas into some external medium where they can be clarified, polished, and properly arranged. Think of it like math. We can do single-digit addition in our head, but multifunction algebra? Too many steps, even for Einstein. However, that same problem is easy when we write it down. Say we've been asked to brief a fresh crop of congressional interns on metro subway escalator etiquette. I'd begin by downloading my initial thoughts in bullet point form. The left side of the escalator is like the fast lane. Standing in the fast lane will, understandably, irritate the locals. When I first got to D.C., I thought walking on an escalator was crazy, too. But within a week, I was doing it like everyone else. The next step is to identify an organizing theme. No matter how complex the topic, you can condense it into a sentence. For example, good parenting requires love, patience, and a willingness to overlook your kids' mistakes and forgive your own. Or, though Marx's account of the problems of capitalism is insightful, 
his solutions are neither morally required nor practically feasible. Or, public speakers require only two core traits, the courage to get up there and the commitment to get better. As a speaker, it's your job to figure out that one-sentence summary, a framework listeners can use to organize your message. A draft core message for the Metro Escalator Etiquette presentation might be, if you're going to stand on the escalator, please scoot to the right. However, points that I failed to include in my original list that are coming to mind now include both the why behind the custom and the qualifier not to take it personally if you get yelled at. The why? It's important to leave the left side of the escalator open for walking because A, many Metro riders have what they consider important events to attend, and getting there on time sometimes requires extreme measures. And B, many people use Metro to connect with Amtrak, Mark, Maryland's commuter rail system, and VRE, Virginia's commuter rail system, which run on tight schedules. Missing your connection can mean the difference between arriving on time or eight hours late. You're excused. People who work and live in D.C. realize that walking on an escalator is odd and are understanding when visitors inadvertently back up the flow. So don't take it personally if someone yells in your direction, asking folks to walk on the left. They're not taking it personally either. Now that we have a decent overview of our main points and the why behind them, we can move into full organization mode. 5. Logically arrange your ideas. When it comes to organizing your message, that cliche, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you've told them, is repeated because it works. Audiences better understand and remember ideas that are introduced early, clearly explained, and then reinforced. The basic structure that works for most any presentation is introduction, preview, body, recap, and close. Depending on your subject, audience, and occasion, you might add elaborations and clarifications, perhaps like this. 1. Introduction Hi, I'm your name. Thanks for coming out. 2. Preview Today I'm going to teach you a bit about X, Y, and Z. 3. Body X, Y, and Z include examples. 4. Elaborations Extra stuff about X, Y, and Z. 5. Clarifications you may think X and Y are the same, but they're not. Here's why. 6. Recap High points about X, Y, and Z. And 7. Close Thanks so much for your attention. For the escalator etiquette presentation, we might arrange the ideas like this. 1. Introduction Hi, I'm Matt. Thanks so much for coming out. 2. Preview Today I'm going to teach you a bit about Metro Escalator Etiquette in Washington, D.C. 3. Body. Walk on the left and stand on the right. Whether you're transferring from the Metro to Amtrak at Union Station or from the Red Line to the Orange Line at Metro Center, in all cases, walk on the left and stand on the right. 4. Elaborations. Just like on the highway, the right lane is for slower traffic and the left lane is for passing. 5. Clarifications. This isn't expected in touristy spots, like inside the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. And if you forget and people yell at you, don't sweat it. They're just in a hurry. 6. Recap Remember to walk on the left and stand on the right. 7. Close Thanks so much for your attention. I begin most talks by introducing myself and thanking the audience for coming, and close by thanking them for their attention. The middle is pretty standard as well. I get the main idea on the table, explain it, elaborate, clarify, and reiterate. This template usually works, but not always. For example, as a comedy club host, my routine would look like this. I'd welcome the audience, preview the touring comics, announce upcoming shows, plug the club's promo items, drink tumblers, t-shirts, whatever, deliver my five-minute joke set, introduce the feature act, thank the feature and introduce the headliner, Thank the headliner and close the show with a raffle, a song, and an invitation to meet the comics in the lounge. If I'd followed my standard model and previewed my jokes in the beginning, tonight I'll tell two jokes about parenting and three about teaching, and recapped the high points at the end. Don't forget that the punchline to my first joke was, unless you're Godzilla...
and the punchline to my last joke was, burn her house down, they wouldn't have been nearly as funny. So use your judgment as to when diverging from the usual model makes sense. If you'll be delivering an argumentative or persuasive presentation, you might explain your issue, preview your current view, support it with reasons, and preemptively respond to potential objections. If your material involves a historical account of a series of events or future steps to be taken in a particular order, presenting your points chronologically will make them easier to follow. For example, when presenting on the expansion of high school ethics bowls at a conference in Cincinnati, I projected a blank map of the U.S. with the heading, Beginning of Time to 2003. Ethics bowls are similar to traditional debates, except participants are not required to disagree and are not assigned positions, but are invited to think through difficult moral and political issues using disinterested reason as their guide. Judged by a mix of ethics professors, public officials, and thoughtful volunteers, the team with the most compelling argument wins. When I clicked to the next slide, the heading changed to 2004. Utah turned green, and I explained how Professor Karen Mazella at Utah Valley University organized the very first high school ethics bowl that year, basing it on the successful intercollegiate ethics bowls model. With each new slide, the date would change and different states would turn green. New Jersey, then North Carolina, Tennessee, New York, Florida, California, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. I went all the way up to the present day, offering details on the different bowls, and closed by projecting bowl growth in the next 10 years, adding commentary on how I envisioned this changing America's often childish and caustic political culture for the better. My point is that since the topic concerned a historical progression, the chronological ordering worked best and the ever-greener map helped the audience understand how ethics bowls were growing and how we might expect the growth to continue. If your topic concerns a system of some sort, you can explain the whole, then break down each part, or explain the parts and work up to the whole, or you can jump into the middle and work your way out. For example, if I were a nursing student asked to give a presentation on the human body, I'd begin by covering how the nervous system controls our muscles, how the digestive system enriches our blood with nutrients, and how the cardiovascular system delivers oxygen. However, a presenter could just as well begin with a blood cell and work her way out, or with the full body and work her way in. You can also organize your topic according to conceptual complexity, or according to the importance of the ideas, or according to an order dictated by someone else. When it appears that different approaches would work equally well, go with whichever resonates with your personality and seems easiest to understand. Last, though it can take some work, logically ordering your presentation has the added benefit of making it easier for you to remember. When your ideas naturally flow from one to the next, you won't have to put much effort into memorization beyond your opening section. Everything falls into place. For example, the first day in my on-site ethics classes goes something like this. After a warm welcome and mutual introductions, I'll explain that philosophy is the reason-based attempt to answer life's big, non-empirical questions, which naturally leads to a discussion on differences between empirical and non-empirical questions, which naturally leads to a discussion on the nature of ethical questions, which naturally leads to an exploration of the differences between morality, psychology, and legality, as well as refutation of moral relativism, which naturally leads to the alternative of moral objectivism, which naturally leads to the four dominant ethical theories, which will then naturally apply to particular ethical issues. Don't worry, we revisit, unpack, and analyze all of this over the course of the semester. That's just the day one preview. You may not be versed in academic ethics. If you'd like to be, check out my Ethics in a Nutshell, The Philosopher's Approach to Morality in 100 Pages. But the point is that once we get rolling, remembering what comes next takes care of itself. Presenting is a matter of following where reason leads, and for audience retention, if a student can remember any one part of the class, he or she can figure out what came both before and after by asking why we were discussing that topic, and what we would have naturally discussed next. Whether you're rallying a t-ball team, briefing congressional interns, or exploring the complexities of philosophical ethics, logically arranging your presentations will make them easier for your audience to understand, and easier for everyone to remember, including you. So take the time. It's well worth it. Six, backfill with analogies, illustrative examples, and stories. Once your main ideas are articulated and arranged, it's time to make them stick. 
My son better understood hockey when related to soccer. And you better understood DC escalator etiquette when related to highway traffic, as well as the importance of stage time for new speakers when related to the importance of pool time for new swimmers. Such is the power of analogy. When creating your own analogies, remember they don't have to be fancy. In fact, straightforward comparisons are often best. If asked to brief your office on the new computer security policy, rather than belaboring every detail, you could explain that it's like the old policy, except now everyone will have to insert their ID card into a special slot. Ta-da! If coaching first-time parents on toddlers, you could tell them that three-year-olds are just like newborns, except three-year-olds eat more, make a bigger mess, require constant monitoring, and will test your sanity at least twice every day. In both cases, simple, direct comparisons work well. One of my favorite analogies uses the image of an elephant rider to teach the basics of motivational psychology. The elephant rider, representing our rational side, is good at analyzing, setting goals, and planning, but lacks the power to accomplish those goals. The elephant, representing our emotional side, seeks instant gratification, and while powerful, is short-sighted and risk-averse. Without the elephant's power, the rider gets nowhere, regardless of the quality of his plans. Without the rider's guidance, the elephant charges recklessly toward reward and away from danger. He can't resist. But together, they accomplish much, especially with a neatly cut path to follow, the path representing whatever change a person wants to bring about. The rider, elephant, and path make the concepts more vivid, clear, and likely to stick in ways a technical explanation couldn't. Also, notice how learning about the elephant rider helped you better understand and appreciate the usefulness of analogies. This speaks to the fact that concepts better resonate when illustrated with examples. Also, notice how learning about the elephant rider helped you better understand and appreciate the usefulness of analogies. This speaks to the fact that concepts better resonate when illustrated with examples. When teaching students how to write for clarity and concision, a fan of writing coach William Zinzer might cite both his good example of good writing is rewriting and the made-up bad example of when an authoring agent undertakes to commit thoughts to paper, he or she accomplishes greater success when writing the second time through in contrast with the first attempt in a written accomplishment. In case you're reading quickly, clarification, the second sentence is an example of what not to do. More on Zinzer's principles in a moment. One pro tip from Carmine Gallo, author of Talk Like Ted, is to make your examples emotionally potent, and when possible, to engage multiple senses, describing the look, sound, smell, feel. For example, Rather than telling your audience that disease X is responsible for a thousand deaths a day, tell them it kills the equivalent of two commercial airliners packed with passengers daily. You don't even have to describe the flames or screams. Your audience's imagination will do that for you. And they'll judge your talk as more compelling as a result. As Gallo explains it, quote, jaw-dropping moments create what neuroscientists call an emotionally charged event a heightened state of emotion that makes it more likely your audience will remember your message and act on it, end quote. You can also reinforce key points with callbacks, mentioning something later in a presentation that was introduced earlier. Comedians, politicians, songwriters, screenwriters, and authors use callbacks all the time. They're effective communication tools because they reactivate recently activated areas of the brain, which releases serotonin, a substance that we experience as pleasurable. Oh, I don't know if that's true. I'm a philosopher, speaker, dude, not a brain scientist. But one thing I can say with confidence is that callbacks boost audience receptivity. I was honored to host my high school class's first reunion, and since I'd known everyone for at least two decades, could reference shared experiences that reinforced our intimacy. Miss Lowe's obsession with owls, Coach Webb's constant need to tilt his head back and re-wet his contact lenses, and how everyone once thought Lily was a witch. Not a mean person witch, but a cauldron-brewing, spell-casting witch. Her husband, Dave, assured us this rumor was and remains false. Now the rumor is that Dave is a warlock. You usually won't know your audience members well enough to reminisce your glory days or accuse them of witchcraft. But you will know them well enough to bring up points you made earlier in your talk. Highlighting that shared experience 
even if it's a brief and superficial shared experience, will produce feelings of trust and warmth typically reserved for people we know well, and your audience will be more receptive as a result. Callbacks also highlight your audience's learning. Remembering what you said earlier confirms that they're retaining your message, which is a boost to their view of you as an expert and teacher and their view of themselves as a listener. For example, near the end of chapter one, I mentioned that becoming an effective public speaker really only takes two traits, the courage to get up there and the determination to get better. As you may have noticed, I've reiterated that key point at least once since, and will reiterate it again before we're through. Hopefully this is helping you appreciate and remember the point, illuminating the fact that you're learning and making you even more receptive to it. Last, from fairy tales to religious allegories to date night at the theater, humans spend their lives immersed in story. Stories help us make sense of our world, of where we've been and where we're going. Stories help us understand, judge, and assimilate new information. And so it shouldn't be surprising that audiences appreciate speakers who storytell. In Talk Like Ted, Gallo cites Princeton psychology professor Yuri Hassan to make the case that packaging your message in story format also causes your audience members' brains to sync up with yours. Their thought patterns will mirror yours, or so say the scientists' functional MRI scans, and this brain-to-brain coupling, as Dr. Hassan calls it, is ideal for idea transfer. If you have little practice, start with Once Upon a Time. Set the scene, describe a hero, a struggle, and work in a plot twist. Of course, make it relevant to the point at hand. Don't recount your awesome hernia operation unless it helps reinforce an important idea. But do experiment, and without pressure to become a playwright. I'm not a storytelling master, but almost always use short stories to convey key points and entertain, and can confirm that audiences eat them up. In summary, use analogies, simple comparisons, illustrative examples, callbacks, and stories to make your ideas stick. Make them emotionally potent and engaging multiple senses when possible. Link your core message to stuff your audience already understands. And plant the suggestion that a random audience member dabbles in witchcraft for added fun. 7. Revise using William Zinser's Four Principles. In William Zinser's now classic book, On Writing Well, you'll find four indispensable principles of effective communication. I keep them in mind anytime I'm writing or presenting, as well as anytime I'm teaching others to write or present. Those principles are clarity. As Zinser says, if it isn't clear, you might as well not write it. You might as well stay in bed. Make certain your words convey exactly what you intend. No more, no less. The only time it's acceptable for an audience to wonder what it is you're trying to say is when your topic is confusion and you're giving an example. Simplicity. Unnecessarily complex words and phrases put a barrier between you and your audience. Use simple, straightforward language and refuse to indulge in pomposity. In fact, refuse to indulge in pomposity is itself a pompous phrase. How about no fancy talk? No need to pretend to be smarter than you are with an inflated vocabulary. All it's likely to do is confuse. Brevity. The human mind can only absorb so much at once. So make your ideas sharp and to the point. Concision is a virtue. Humanity. Find, embrace, and develop your unique voice. As I've always taught my college students, do not adopt the style of the philosophers we'll be reading. Even though they've authored some of the most amazing ideas in human history, communicating those ideas hasn't always been their strong suit. I like this principle so much, I made it a commandment. Zinzer and Deaton agree, be thyself. Zinzer's advice is pure gold and just as applicable to speaking as writing. If you burden your audience with a complicated, muddled message, they'll tune out. But give them a clear, brief message and deliver it using your authentic voice, that's the stuff of quality communicators. Zinzer also teaches that good writing is rewriting. Babies may be born perfect, but ideas usually aren't. This is why revising your speaking notes and rehearsing your presentations is important. Each time through, you'll think of new ways to improve. A more logical ordering here, a clearer example there. 
And while revision and practice take effort, if you expect your audience to give you their time and attention, respect them enough to deliver a polished product. This is easier when you follow the advice of productivity guru Steve Robbins, author of The Get It Done Guy's Nine Steps to Work Less and Do More. As Steve explains, scientists recently confirmed what common sense already told us, that multitasking, while fun, isn't efficient and tends to degrade quality. Although switching back and forth among lots of unrelated tasks keeps our brains stimulated, it also keeps them in first gear. But when we focus on a single task for a dedicated chunk of time, we acclimate, get in a groove, and produce much better results. Stever recommends categorizing the items on our to-do list according to the sort of activities they entail and tackling one group at a time. When it comes to public speaking, message creation and editing involve different parts of the brain. Therefore, when you're doing the initial down dump, drafting the outline, or backfilling with analogies, let the ideas flow. Don't stop to judge or analyze. Just get it onto the page. Once you're through creating, then go back and change, rearrange, and polish. You can't expect your mind to create high-quality content when it's in edit mode or to do high-quality editing when it's in create mode. So when you see an opportunity to do one activity while you're engaged in another, just insert a note and return to it later. Typing those notes in all caps will help you find them. For example, notes like develop Stever task segregation advice here and cut the clutter in this section were strewn throughout draft versions of this book. The same is true for my presentation drafts, where I'll usually indicate my notes to self with brackets, such as bracket, find a better visual for this bracket, or bracket, open with speaker sponsorship thanks bracket, or bracket, confirm pronunciation of this dude's name bracket. Cut the clutter is a nice bonus tip for Mr. Sensor. Clutter refers to words and phrases that don't contribute new or essential meaning. Clutter confuses your core message and distracts your audience. Consider the following sentences. 1. I believe that cutting clutter is the absolute most important activity in which a person can engage when preparing a presentation outline. 2. When preparing your outline, it's important to cut the clutter. Though both say essentially the same thing, the first is 22 words while the second is 10. How do we say the same thing with half the words? For starters, I believe is unnecessary. For of course, I believe what I'm saying. Further, activity in which a person can engage is ridiculously cumbersome. Even the word presentation is clutter, for it's obvious from context that the only outline we'd be discussing is a presentation outline. The second sentence is clearly superior. But it doesn't quite emphasize that cutting the clutter is the most important step, not simply an important step. An alternative coming in at just under 10 words, when preparing your outline, Clutter cutting is most important. Simple, clear, clutter free. Wall Street Journal columnist Peggy Noonan explained clutter cutting like this Remember the waterfront shack with the sign Fresh Fish Sold Here? Of course it's fresh. We're on the ocean. Of course it's for sale. We're not giving it away. Of course it's here. Otherwise the sign would be someplace else. The final sign Fish. Clutter cutting can be painful. You realize that material you've spent hours developing is irrelevant, unclear, too long-winded, not true to your voice. And you'll be tempted to keep it. Be strong! Keep and mold ideas directly linked to your presentation goals and junk the rest. And if you can't bring yourself to simply delete it, save your clutter in a second file entitled Scraps. The scraps file will make clutter easier to cut, and you'll have it should you change your mind or develop a similar presentation later. Key takeaways. Clarify your goals and sketch an outline. Begin with the end in mind, what you aim to achieve, and your essential message. Embrace your role as expert and teacher. You're expected to understand your subject and transfer that understanding to your audience. Internalize that responsibility now. Consider your audience. Tailor your message to match their background, expectations, and goals. Download and unpack your core message. Revisit and flesh out the skeleton you drafted in step one. 
logically arrange your ideas. Chronologically, according to conceptual complexity, methodologically, whichever order will best facilitate communication. Backfill with analogies, illustrative examples, and stories. Relate your message to things your audience already understands and mix in a story or two. Revise using Zenzer's four principles. Revise everything for clarity, simplicity, brevity, and humanity. Remember that good writing is rewriting and cut all in essential clutter.